I am uh, Beth Cooper Benjamin. I am the director of programs and peer networks here at the Jewish Funders Network, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you to today's program, Infectious Generosity, with Ted's Chris Anderson in conversation with Rabbi David Wolpe. We're so pleased to have you here and thrilled to be able to uh, to feature this program and share it with our, our members. Uh, I am going to hand things over momentarily to our member, Laura Lauder, who graciously uh, has brought this program to us today. Uh, but before I do, I know many of you are uh, excited to uh, partake of the offer, uh, it, practicing a, a bit of infectious generosity that uh, Laura Lauder has made to share a copy of Chris Anderson's book with attendees today. Uh, so uh, certainly this seems very fitting in a program about infectious generosity. And I wanna thank Laura Lauder for, uh, for bringing us these wonderful guests for today's conversation and also for, for her personal generosity and offering to, to share a copy of infectious generosity with, with JFN members who are joining us live today. Um, so I, I just want to do a brief bit of housekeeping to let folks know how this is going to work. Uh, next week, you will receive an email from JFN with uh, a bit of a heads up and a reminder about the book giveaway. Uh, for which JFN is working with Amazon's bookshelf service. The email from JFN will be followed about a day later by an email directly from Amazon. And that email will have a link that you can click on uh, through which you'll be able to claim your copy of the book. For US-based JFN members, you'll be able to select either a hard copy or an ebook. Uh, because Amazon's bookshelf service only ships to US addresses, if you are outside the United States, you'll instead be provided with a voucher to claim an electronic copy, which we can get to you wherever you are. Uh, this is a new system for JFN, uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you encounter any issues, and we will be happy to help you figure it out. Uh, and with no further delay, I am going to turn the proceedings over to uh, social entrepreneur and venture philanthropist and JFN member, Laura Lauder. Thank you so much, Beth. It is such a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I am so thrilled to be introducing Chris Anderson and David Wolpe. You know, my husband Gary and I have been Tedsters since day one. Uh, we are such loyal fans and frankly, just aspirational Tedsters to do what Chris Anderson has described as bringing this persuasive notion of infectious generosity to the world. You know, it's really a Jewish tradition and a Jewish notion of tikkun olam and tzedakah. And so it just felt so appropriate for us to try to bring this, the, this, this very well-researched book and, and, and very um, uh, uh, passionate guru of, of philanthropy to all of you. We also have been big fans of of Chris Anderson's efforts to bring infectious generosity to, uh, to, a, to a, a group of, of folks called the Audacious Donors. We have come multiple years to work with Chris on identifying some of the most audacious large scale projects to really do serious tikkun olam in, 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 in the wide world and beyond, and so some, of the, some of them are methane gas satellite detectors, so it's even beyond. And, and at the end of the day, what we found is that this idea of infectious generosity has to permeate the world. And so I thought it would be great to bring it to our Jewish community. Thank you to JFN for, for doing this. And now I will, I will introduce very quickly Chris and David. All of you know that Chris was trained as a journalist from Oxford University and then launched more than 100 successful magazines before turning his attention to TED, which he acquired as a nonprofit in 2001. You know, his mantra is ideas worth spreading. It continues to blossom on an international scale with more than 1 billion TED Talks viewed annually. 
So Chris is such a, a, an infectious person himself, and you'll see in his enthusiasm how much fun it is to, uh, to, to learn from Chris. And then David Wolpe, our dear friend, who is a, an extraordinary rabbi now, um, now emeritus at Rabbi Te uh, Sinai Temple in, uh, in, 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 in LA, oh. and, and now at, uh, a visiting mm. scholar at Harvard Divinity School, author of eight books, including the national bestseller, Making Loss Matter, Creating Meaning in Difficult Times. David has been named as the most influential rabbi in America by Newsweek, among the 50 most influential Jews in the world by the Jerusalem Post, and twice named among the 50 most influential Angelinos by LA Magazine. We are so thrilled to have you both. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Over to you, David. The first, first of all, I wanna thank Laura and I wanna thank JFN for making this possible. And also, of course, I wanna show you the book. This is the book. So, um, and uh, I, as, as somebody who has gone to TED many times um, and, uh, and has always benefited from it, I also wanna thank Chris um, for making such an extraordinary contribution to American and world culture, um, both international TED and, and TED here. And, but I'm gonna jump right into it uh, with, a, with that uh, being the minimum of throat clearing by asking, starting with this question, which is part of the premise of the book is um, to quote what you write explicitly, we are built to be generous. Why is that a surprising statement to most people? Because I think if you say to most people, we're built to be generous, they'll say, no, we aren't, we're built, we're built to be selfish. So tell us how to see that. Mm. Thanks, David. Thanks, Laura. It's great, great to be with you all. Um, for someone who's religious, it's not necessarily a surprising statement. I mean, I, I'm not Jewish. I, I uh, grew up Christian. My parents were Christian missionaries in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, but um, um, and it, it, the existence of generosity per se wasn't a riddle, although there were other demonic forces arrayed against it in, in, inside us and the way that we were, we were brought up. But as, as a secular person, like studying philosophy at Oxford, for example, and trying to understand this, it was a puzzle to me of whether there was any possibility of, of generosity if uh, without a, a religious framing for it. Um, I couldn't see how, frankly, like life was just a struggle and people were built to survive and we know you know, the evolutionary story is, is one of, um, uh, you know, a, a su survival of the fittest. Where, where would generosity come into that? Um, but it turns out there is a pretty compelling <laughs> scientific story about how uh, an alternative way uh, of building generosity into humans is via evolution, that, that um, selfish genes can build unselfish species, unselfish people. And, and actually, unselfishness is a great survival mechanism if you're say a small community battling for survival on the savannah you know your your ability to cooperate with each other may make all the difference um and so whether you think god put it there or whether you think god let evolution put it there or evolution put it there on its own um i think it's unquestionably true that that form a form of generosity is wired deeply now it's not a perfect form of generosity and it's not the only thing that's inside us you're, you're right that there are many other very powerful instincts but we definitely at a minimum respond intensely when we see someone in our in-group suffering we just do it's a it's a it's an intense uh instinctive reaction to care and i think a lot else can be built on that like with many of other of our instincts we have to shape it reflectively but it is there and it is powerful and how much i mean in in, in the jewish tradition giving tzedakah giving what what is translated as charity but it's not exactly charity is mandatory mm. so there's a sense in which sometimes people are compelled to be generous even though they buy into the larger system presumably for that reason and I wonder how much you think it's important that you do something or that you do something for the right motivation. Because I just want, your book is motivational. Um, like when you finish it, you wanna be generous, but I wonder how important you think that is as opposed to the comp compulsion part. Look, I think every society has wrestled with this. 
um, we have these instincts, but they are fragile. And every culture, every religion has actually tried to shape them and to say, you know, this actually matters. You must do this. Um, we're in a world now where a lot of people aren't summoned every week to be reminded to be their, their better selves and to be reminded that life is about something bigger than you are. And I think that may be a big problem. Um, I don't know that people are always capable of acting on, on that generosity instinct. So what I, what I do think is that we should use every argument we can in this modern era to encourage people to be generous, which means a flip in what sometimes happens, like we're in a cynical era, as you know, and often when people do something that is in others' interests, they immediately get criticized for it. I mean, if it's, say it's a financial gift, it's like, well, you're just reputation laundering, or where did you actually get that money? And uh, so we, like, we look for every reason we can to downplay what people are doing. And I, I think that is very destructive. I think we should be trying to do the opposite. We should be looking for good motivation wherever we can find it. And if there are additional reasons that are in someone's motivation set, for example, that, hey, we're in the connected age, reputation can spread. I actually think that's something to be celebrated, not not criticized. Um, and so I'm, yes, the book, there's a whole chapter in the book called Imperfect Generosity. I think that's what we should embrace. It is a mistake to think of it as this pure thing that will just happen out of pure morality. Um, there are arguments why it is in our long-term interest to be generous, and we should celebrate those arguments. So before I get to some of the specific like emotions and stories, because really pe people should know this is a book of just wonderful stories, uh, unusual, striking stories. Um, I want to ask about the TED connection to this, because anybody who's gone to TED sees that one of the ways of framing it is these are people who've done extraordinary things for the world. And I want you to I want them to tell you what it is that they have done so that you know about it and they model this. And that's a kind of seed of spread of infectious generosity. So do you see this as having grown from that, as being associated with that? Is this what taught you that this was possible? Yes, I think it did. I think it did. I think, I mean, first of all, we the first thing we say to speakers is to come to the TED stage with a spirit of generosity. Um, sometimes talks are viewed as here's my chance to promote my agenda, my cause, my company, myself. Uh, audiences see through that in a nanosecond and and actually shut down. Um, what you want to come with is is the notion of I have a I have something kind of remarkable that has come from my life experience or my learning. It's this little pattern in my brain, and if I just utter the right words in the right way, it can spread into these other minds, and they may benefit from this for for years actually i mean this is what this is what ideas are it's why ideas are so powerful they literally reshape who we are so that that is a gift and i think the fact that speakers are willing to often spend months preparing for the best expression of their idea uh, without being paid is is indeed an act of generosity even though they themselves may well gain, gain from it in terms of their own influence and and so forth um but the but the and then the other piece that 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 we stumbled onto, David, was just that the the experience of the decision to give away content online at the time felt risky. So when I took over TED, it was a, an annual conference. It was you know eight hundred people came to and knew about, um, and but it was inspiring. And we felt it, I took it over using a nonprofit, and I felt an obligation that we should try and share this knowledge more broadly. But the risk was if you if you just gave it away for free that you would kill the conference. Why would someone pay all that money um, if, if it was available free? Um, taking the risk to do it turned out to be not just a good thing, but in terms of lots of people getting the knowledge, it turned out to be the smartest possible thing for the organization itself at the conference. It boosted demand for the conference. And, and so it was it was this as much as anything that convinced me that in this connected age, the rules about what you hang on to and what you give away have shifted. And, and boy, it's worth paying attention to that, that if you give away something that seems hard to give away, you may be absolutely amazed at the ripple effects that come from that, simply because it can spread to an unlimited number of people. 
um, triggering responses. We're, we're wired to feel, to have generosity. We're also wired to respond to it. And so th this, this was the miracle that, that, that happened. And it got me just excited and convinced that, I mean, I think generosity has always been important. It's always been infectious in this connected moment. It matters more than ever and has more potential than ever to spread across the world. So one of the, it seems to me, one of the key sort of concepts that certainly Ted has spoken about over the years is this idea of mirror neurons. I wonder if you would tie that in to how generosity works. Right. So so it's this weird um, neurological function that we have that um, uh, that is really at the heart of what creates empathy um, and many other aspects of our social uh, the fact that we're a social species, is that when we see someone else suffering or experiencing some emotion, we, part of our brain feels that same emotion. We are literally wired to tell from people's expressions and what they're saying and their context. We can imagine what they're feeling and we actually feel that same thing. If there's someone next to us shivering in fear, we feel some of that. If there's someone next to us suffering in pain, there's a way in which we feel the pain and it motivates us to want to engage and to do something about it. So it's, it's really a remarkable technology. It's, a, it's also, I would say, a crude technology uh, for several reasons. Paul Bloom, the psychologist, wrote a, wrote a book called Against Empathy, arguing that um, it could, this this experience could actually lead us astray. For one thing, it's much more targeted at in-groups, not out-groups. Um, right. And uh, and so, you know, it, ma it makes us, we can be very generous and empathetic to people um, in our in-group, however you want to define that, and much less so to people who are not in it. That can be a problem. And and the good news is that there is that the gap between those two is malleable. It's not set in stone. It's not defined by any one thing. And and arguably, we have a duty to try and expand our. So, but but it it is so. So mirror neurons provide the initial engine, the motivation to care about something beyond yourself, comes from the fact that we feel each other's emotions. If I can, I'll take the narrator's uh, or the interviewer's privilege of telling a very short story about last, what happened yes. to me last night. I went to a dinner at Harvard Divinity School, and I don't have to tell anybody on this call about the divisions and fighting that has existed at Harvard. And I saw three Muslims from the school sitting around and speaking Arabic. And so I just sat myself down with them. And I said, mm. this is who I am. I said, and I'm a mainstream Zionist, and I really want to talk to you guys. And we talked for an hour and exchanged emails. And it was just a function of actually, when you look people in the eye and you engage them human to human, they're human. And oh. they, I mean, we saw that in each other. So I think that that's, it's very powerful when you take that risk. Wow. Thank you for doing this. You know, I, I, I've become convinced that one of the most crucial forms of generosity for this moment that we're in is exactly what you did. I, I mean, in the book, I call it bridging um, to have the courage to listen to someone else who, who is quote other um, with respect and to, and to just to listen. My mother always used to tell me, you cannot judge someone until you know their story, until you really know their story. And by the way, when you really know their story, you won't want to judge them. No. Right. I mean, this, this is, we have forgotten this. We have forgotten this in the, in the world that we're in of weaponized text snippets that we send hurling at each other across social media, you know, increasing our divides and in bringing with them things that fight any form of listening or respect, feelings like anger and disgust. Right. Um, and it's terribly, terribly, terribly dangerous. And uh, the world needs more people like you, David, who are willing to sit down. Like that act you did, there will be people, possibly even people listening right now, where part of their instinct is, are you sure? Did you really want to do that? I, I know. Um, <laughs> A friend of mine said that when I told them last night that that's what I did. They said, I, 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 don't, I, I don't, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> So, 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 so the worst blowback can come from people, quote, on your side. And, yes. and, and the reason this is, takes courage is that you are, you know, it's like you're in the, it's the First World War and you're, you're standing up in the middle between these two sides in their trenches and, and you're risking getting your own, your own head blown off. Um, it's, it's not easy to do. But in, until we do that, that I, I think we're really in danger of talking ourselves into ever greater 
divisions and um and, uh, unable to solve any of the problems we have so there there is something you have in the book that i'd like you to talk about you quoted in the name of Thich Nhat Han. i had heard it years ago with, uh, from simone ve about how attention is a form of prayer um that was how she put it but you also talk about how important attention is and i wonder if you would say something about that so it's the first act of generosity is the shifting of attention from yourself to, to someone else or something else out, out outside you. And it's not always that easy to do. We spend most of our days busy, a little bit stressed. We almost sort of, you can easily go through a day almost sleepwalking where you've got, you know, you're on a timetable, you've got to get to work. You've then got a long email list inbox and this and this is coming at you. And there is no mental space in that to feel anyone else's need or to or to think about it even and so it's 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 actually impossible to be generous until you can make that first gift of attention and um how it happens is is you know its own like usually it happens in response to some sort of feeling of gratitude or some I guess just noticing the humanity in someone else and saying, okay, I'm going to look you in the eye and um, listen and spend some time in the, in the way that you did the other night. That was not easy for you to yeah. take out that, take up that hour. So that, that gift of attention, everything starts there. And the amazing thing is that, and, and there are stories of this in the book that, you know, you start, you start with that gift of listening to someone, they feel heard, extraordinary ripples can spread from that moment in in different ways because both parties in that situation feel motivated to do something about it often and uh it, it's but yeah it all starts there i could i mean i could just talk to you and i would love to but i actually have a job to do so i want it i want to prompt you on a story and then talk about the larger movement that you're actually building here mm. so just as an example of the kind of story you tell in the book um, you, you talk about different attributes, humor, and I want to focus on courage. And you tell the story of Daryl Davis and uh, a black man and what he did. And I think if people don't know this story, it's it's extraordinarily powerful. So would you tell us what happened? Yes, I will. Um, Daryl Davis was a musician, um, African-American, um, was puzzled why people, some people, hated him for the color of his skin in America. So he went on the, his own sort of curiosity journey and reached out to the local leader of the Ku Klux Klan, invited him to a meeting. <laughs> it was a very tense meeting. Uh, they all leapt to their feet at one point thinking someone had drawn a gun. Um, it was ice clinking. Um, and, um, um, and somehow they survived the meeting and um, met again and developed this strange friendship. Daryl ended up going to KKK rallies several times. Um, and um, to cut a long story short, eventually he persuaded this man to leave the KKK. Uh, several dozens others followed. And, um, and, and this story spread across the internet. Why? Because uh, across the world, CNN covered it. And I think the reason they covered it was because of his courage. It's like courage like that creates a wow. And it's it's an example of a good thing that can compete with the usual news diet of if it bleeds, it leads. You know, here is a wow moment. And so I, I, I talk about courage in the book is it is one of the catalysts that we need to own if we want kindness to go to spread. Being bold is one of the key things that can happen. He was bold in the most amazing way. And in a way that I think the world needs now more than Ever. It's this courage of a bridging, of being willing to listen to people who most of your friends think are disgusting right. and to see what you can do from there. And infectiousgenerosity.org, which is the website that I want to make sure people are aware of. Um, what are you trying? I mean, we know what you're trying to build in terms of the in terms of the um, the spreading of generosity and goodness and kindness and openness to the other, but can you explain more like the structure of what it is you want us to be a part of? I mean, in one way, uh, I don't know what the final outcome of this is. I mean, you got, you know, it's too much to say, oh, we want to start a movement, so forth. The, you know, the, the internet 
and the world has a way of deciding itself what is going to yeah. become a movement or not. But what we what we want to do is just to is to share stories of inspiring acts that have a chance at uh, creating further ripple effects. The amazing thing about ripple effects is that you never know what will be the moment that really, when the butterfly triggers the hurricane, um, it, beautiful, beautiful things can happen. We have on that website um, an, <laughs> an AI agent that I'm actually quite excited about. It's called TIG, the Infectious Generosity Guru. And it is intended as a, as a catalyst to help people brainstorm their own generosity journey. Um, you know, AI is, you know, is amazing, scary, all, all of the above. Um, but um, this, this has been designed specifically to focus on help, helping people discover what they could do. And, and it's surprisingly good at when you, when you say, look, this is what I'm interested in and this is my skill set. Um, it's surprisingly good at sort of sparking a little brainstorm, and uh, so that's 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 one thing that I, I think could could be a useful outcome. And then we're just gathering um, other other stories. I mean, that the beautiful thing about infectious generosity is that it changes the power dynamics. You know, I, I start the book by you know you imagine the world from the point of view of the little coronavirus that existed just before COVID nineteen sitting there thinking to itself, I'm so tiny, no one can see me. I weigh less than a trillionth of a gram. I can't possibly have any impact on the future of anything. And uh, mama says, well, don't be so down on yourself. You never know. And, um, you know, one little tweak of, um, you know, those external spike proteins, and suddenly it enters a human, roll the clock forward a month and it shut down the world economy. Um, right. And, uh, or roll the clock forward a year rather. Right. I mean, you, so, so you don't need to be big. In this connected area, you don't need to be big to be powerful. Being no. infectious will do just nicely. And if if we can figure out how to express generosity in a way that, that spreads, all bets are off as to what could happen as a result from that. I do think, I guess, it's kind of the Rosa Parks effect, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> I do also do think that it's true that when people realize that being generous is actually so life-giving and so um it fills you so much uh in a way that you don't expect or you don't anticipate um which is something that that that's a privilege that that you get if you're a clergy like you you're supposed to go do the wedding you may not want to have to put on the tuxedo and go but then you do the wedding and you feel great about having being able to be a part of that um yes. i do want to ask you though especially because at TED, you have interacted with some of the wealthiest people in the world. And many years ago, I got into trouble with some of my donors by writing an article in the LA Times that quoted all these statistics that show that wealthy people tend to be less generous than poor people. Mm. The bigger the car you drive, the less likely you are to stop for a pedestrian, that kind of thing. And, and the theory behind it is not that wealthy people are bad, but that wealth insulates you from human contact so you don't feel the same sense of interdependence on people and therefore you're not as attuned to them. So I'm wondering, you you not only know some of the wealthiest people in the world, but some of the most generous wealthy people in the world. I wonder what you think helps overcome that innate distance when you have a lot and you live in a big house and you drive a big car and you're separate from others um, mm. and you need to relate to them. Just before I answer that, David, I'm just just passing on a message from Beth here that I'm not sure that everyone can see, which is just that if you've got a question, use the Q&A tab at the bottom, because I'm not sure that chat is is on for uh, everyone. So Q&A okay. is, is on. And uh, I think, I think um, anyway, it's from Beth. Thank you. Um, um, look, this is an important, such an important question, because I mean, I, I'm huge, you know, probably too huge a percentage of the world's resources are controlled by rich people. And um, and it's pretty worrying if they're not feeling the need to contribute so much to the public good. I think, you know, I've, I've had, because of um, my experience at TED and also with the audacious project that uh, Laura mentioned, I've had a chance to 
sit down and talk with a lot of wealthy people. And I, uh, you know, no, no one's perfect, but by and large, I've been thrilled and delighted at how many of them are deadly serious about wanting to give back in some way. Now, I think the richer you get, the more your sense of the relative values of time and money shift. And so for very rich people, their time suddenly becomes by far their most precious resource. And so maybe they're less likely to give their time to someone because that's, you know, um, mm -hmm. that, that they have the same limits on that as everyone else. And, and arguably we shouldn't judge them for that. What we should do is to encourage them to give what they really can give which is these vast sums of money that they have. And, and so I think, I think philanthropy, especially, you know, big donor philanthropy is at a very, it's, it's at a really interesting moment. Um, right. I think it's incredibly hard to do philanthropy well. And, um, and this is probably the biggest single explanation for why, in my view, not nearly enough of it is being done. Right. Um, but another reason why enough of it, not enough of it is being done is that, even people's attempts to do a bit of it often runs into massive public cynicism and pushback. And so people tend to just retreat into the, I would, I would call, I would say without wanting to offend anyone, but the sort of cozy philanthropy of giving to your peers, like they you know, put my name on a building or, or, you know, right. whatever, um, as opposed to really sitting down and saying, how could this money make a massive difference to the future of the world and and all of its humans and and i and i i the, the the shift that i i would so love to happen um and that the audacious project is trying to play a part in doing is to change the conversation from instead of you know what's my philanthropic obligation and and it becoming if for a lot of donors it's giving is almost like this awkward slightly uncomfortable slightly annoying sense of obligation that i have to do to flip it from that to an exploration of amazing. You know, that there are these amazing underexplored opportunities to really tackle some of the biggest issues we're facing in a, in a brilliant and in, ingenious way that can have massive impact. And it's about finding, you know, the type of leverage that will achieve that, whether you're leveraging the market or government or technology or what, whatever it is. Philanthropy is capable of being amazing. And I would, I would so love the world, not the whole world, not just the rich, to be dreaming about what philanthropy could do. And I, I you know, that's honestly one of the biggest outcomes I would love from this book is to just to persuade a few people to think about the excitement of giving and the possibility of what can happen when you really dream about it and when you combine resources and bring people together. I'm I'm so glad, first of all, that you meant that you said explicitly it's not only about being wealthy. In fact, in Jewish law, when a beggar receives money, their first obligation is to turn around and give some of it to someone who's less wealthy, Whoa. just so that they will know that they can give as well. Because wow. the ability to know you can give is so and and you have a beautiful section in here about materialism and how the things that we most value, even though we think they're material. Are almost always love, justice, kindness are not material. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, we're, we're so weird. We're so weird. Like part of us, there's there's a part of us that is just wired to be acquisitive. Like we're, we we want we falsely believe <laughs> that were we to have twenty percent more than we have, um, an achievable amount more, an amount more that you could work on and fight for 20%. Um, if we had that, we would be happy. Our problems would be, would be resolved. And this is, if you if you put it in evolutionary theory, this is an incredibly powerful engine to plant inside an ambitious ape's mind because it, it can lead to constantly foraging and gathering more territory and fighting you know, for it. And it doesn't matter that six months after you've had that gain, the, uh, the the pleasure has gone, and that you actually want another twenty percent because this is how an ape can, um, you know, extend its footprint across an ever ever bigger area. And this is what 
humans have done it. I think it's unfortunately a reason why we have taken over the planet. And it's, but when you shift, but it's a trick. It's literally an evolutionary trick being played on us by our genes. We're being defrauded into thinking this is the path to happiness. It, it, there's, you know, hedonic adaptation is demonstrated again and again in science. It does not deliver lasting happiness. And the thing that does deliver lasting happiness is veiled from us in, in, the, in, in a way that I, I, I think is so unfortunate. Like, you're right, David, that when you, when you give and overcome the sort of loss aversion and the fears and, you know, the, 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 all, all the busyness of life, it is it is shocking how good that can feel and and giving you know if you when you think of generosity as a muscle that you develop it and you get better at it but you also discover again and again yeah no this is the pathway to my saying to myself oh this is my better self i like this version of me i feel a little bit prouder of who i am today that's that's a beautiful that's a really really beautiful thing so i i a few what you said just reminded me a few weeks ago, I was on a Zoom with David Brooks and, and Dr. Waldinger, who did does the Harvard Longitudinal Study. And it was all about, as you well know, that the health of your, that the longevity of your life and the, the, the goodness of your life is not actually about how much you have, but the quality of your relationships. Mm. So what I wanted to ask you was, what have you seen generosity do to relationships? Because it seems to me integral to how we think about our relationships. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I just think it, it it deepens it. I think every which way you can think of it. I mean, if you're, let's say, to take the most fundamental and obvious one, if you were choosing a life partner, would you rather choose someone who was generous or who wasn't? <laughs> I mean, you. you know, you could, I don't think they put that on Tinder, but they possibly, like it's, <laughs> Um, but but so hospitality is one of the, the most primal forms of generosity. It's in every culture and it's an absolutely beautiful act. When people break bread together, eat, drink together, it is that that develops deep bonds. Um, and I think we're actually in danger of losing some of those gatherings because of all the demands of, of our ele electronic age. That's a tragedy. If if there's nothing else that someone does as a result of listening to this, have a dinner party, invite people you care about. And as well as the eating and drinking together, maybe do a little dreaming together. You know, is what do we care about? Like, is there anyone in our community who could use some help? Is there someone doing admirable work that 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 could use our collective support? Because the 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 process of a group of people coming together backing someone, you know, that, that, that in itself just creates huge, huge joy. Um, so no, I think, I think everything that we do is amplified by um, doing it with others and the very act of doing it with others deepens those relationships. And I think that is where some of the, the joy that is associated with generosity comes from. So let me talk about a generous act that you did that that also raises questions that are fundamental to what we're talking about here, which is TEDx. Mm -hmm. That is, you took TED and you allowed other people all over the United States, I guess all over the world really, to, to do their sort of mini TEDs. So high schools do TED Talks or what they call TED Talks. I mean, it's everywhere, everywhere. And, and people feel like they're, in, they feel a sense of importance because they've given a TED Talk even though it's called a TEDx talk, it's still a TED talk in their minds and in their communities. So the reason I bring that up is not only because it's a, it's a beautiful thing and I participated and it's wonderful, but also because it talks, it, it's related to the internet and the way in which the internet can both destroy this impulse to generosity that you talk about, or at least impair it and also promote it. So as somebody who is deeply uh, embedded in the digital world, what are your thoughts about that? So this is this is huge. I mean, this is really a core argument in the book. Um, our experience of giving away content and seeing that it actually helped us rather than the opposite made us obsessed with the idea of 
radical generosity, for want of a better word, that, that the rules have changed. In this connected era, letting go of stuff can be the best, smartest thing you can do. Um, we, so, so like it, it definitely felt like a risk giving away our brand and inviting other people to do TED events that we didn't control. Um, there were a few rules and we gave as much advice as we could on how to do it, but we had a small team and, you know, you just can't put on dozens and then hundreds and then ultimately there are 3000 of these around the world. Um, um, and what happened occasionally was super embarrassing. Um, you have to be ready if you're going to let go for things to go wrong. Um, Harvard <laughs> Business Review <laughs> published this wonderful post by, you know, how Ted lost control of its crowd as if this was a disaster, but this was a triumph because right. the crowd taught us things that we could never have done. A Although a few of the events were bad, the vast majority were amazing. Like if you, if you measure these things on net promoter yeah. score, that 70 plus was the average net promoter score type rating of these events. And, and they, um, um, they delivered now like 25,000 videos a year mm. um, that it, you, you know, you just you just couldn't do this in a, in a traditional model. So so the big aha to me was, yes, we gave away our brand. What we got back was unbelievable generosity from actually tens of thousands of people. Right at this moment, there's more than fifty thousand volunteers out there working on TEDx events on their own. Amazing. Monday, um, and um, and so, so so it what made sense. Sure, for a nonprofit, I'm convinced it makes sense for an individual and for any company or organization to ask that question, what is our radical generosity strategy? What actually could we give away in this connected age that might fly across the world and um, and might surprise us as to what happens next? I think really, if you could, if that thought took hold across corporate America and educational America, business America, it could have untold consequences. And as you say, they're, they're unlikely to lose from it. They really are unlikely to lose. Um, so is there any particular story? I, I, I want to swap stories with you. Tell us a story, either from the book or from your experience of generosity that really touched you. Hmm. I think, I think one of the ones I'll talk about is just, you know, when I, I talk about generosity spreading across the internet i think a lot of people what we're all fighting is is the sense that the internet seems really really mean and it almost seems like a hopelessly naive thing to hope for but um i was actually really inspired by talking with a 23 year old um, who works in a sandwich shop his parents syrian immigrants um and he's you know he's started he's become something of a TikTok influencer um and um, he, you know, there was this trend on TikTok for these sort of disgusting amounts of food waste being dumped. Um, and people look at the mess I made in my parents' kitchen. And he was, he was horrified by this and thought he would take it on. And so he, he shot a video of huge amounts of peanut butter and jelly and bread, which he handmade into sandwiches and then wrapped them individually, took them out on the street gave them to people who looked like they could use a sandwich. And um, this video uh, was seen by far more, far more than the trend he was combating. And he gave me a lot of hope talking to him that at least the generation coming through is not gonna put up with, with the mean online world that arguably we've, we've bestowed on them. He, he said things to me like, look, Anything that sparks emotion will go viral on the internet. And the easiest way to do it, sure, kick someone, video it, it'll go viral. But you can't build anything that way. If you want to build a presence that, that lasts, people respond to the good stuff. I mean, there's Mr. Beast over there on YouTube with his 240 million subscribers now. And not everyone loves him, but he is inspiring millions and millions and millions of next generation people to believe that kindness can be amazing, can be cool. Um, Milad Merg was was one of those people actually, and so it's it's it really gave me hope that I, I look at the online situation right now. I see it as like a forty five fifty five percent thing that the fifty five percent is the ugliness and the toxicity and so forth, but it, it's it's actually a tide that can be turned. 
if we don't do it, the next generation will. But I, I think it's in everyone's interest to try to play their part in that. Do you think, I mean, this may be getting uh, out of, over, over the skis, but do you think there are any changes that should be made to the way the internet ecosystem works that would help? Yeah, I mean, the, the fundamental problem is is that people have, I, I think the creators of social media have been very naive about human nature. Um, I, I was brought up believing that, you know, mankind is born into sin and that uh, we have this perpetual battle. Um, I, I think Judaism, just from the whole story of G Genesis, I mean, there's a sort of a similar um, belief there. Yeah. And a lot of uh, modern secular thought let go of that. The hippie generation certainly let, let go of that. We're all wonderful. We're all fundamentally good. Just let people follow their dreams. What can go wrong? Right. Well, we're not fundamentally good and we're not fundamentally bad. We're complex as anything. And we have these uh, instinctive selves and these reflective selves. And too much of social media has basically succeeded by tapping into our instinctive selves, also known as our lizard brains, um, with the fast clicks, the fast responses, our fast thinking is what is effective at whole, gluing us to doom scrolling and so forth. It's turning us into lizards. It's amplifying that part of ourselves. So that, that's what needs to change is, is a determined effort to figure out how do we tap into the, our reflective selves? How do we do what every mother does when she has an angry, angry kid there? Stop. Count to 10. You know what, what you're doing there is you're 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 bringing literally a different set of brain circuitry to bear. Yes, and, and that's that is what that is what we have to do. How, one question that was asked online was, how do you give money to someone who could definitely use it, especially a friend, without embarrassment or insult? Hmm. It's it's a good question because a lot of us, a lot of times when we get a gift, someone who's getting it feels like you're saying that I am a needy person and it right. feels it, that's too much for some egos to bear. I think it's probably different in each, in each case. It just involves a real conversation and maybe it involves some vulnerability in doing it. It's like, look, um, we're, we're all, we all have different patterns to our lives. I've been incredibly lucky these last few years. I've noticed you've had some really, unlucky things happen to you you know we this isn't right would you do me would you would you allow me the gift of giving you this it will make me happy i i you know it's it's the right thing to do and right. so there's no i don't think there's one right way to do it but i think a, a lot a lot of it probably stems from um deliberately taking away the sort of you know the power dynamic the hierarchy the rich person yeah 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 the hierarchy is really i so the, the story i was going to tell you which um profoundly affected me is one year we had someone speak on yom kippur which is the holiest day of the year so beverly hills lawyer and she worked for something called jewish world watch and she had gone to uh the sudan and she was there in a relocation camp and she was with women who had been just brutalized just brutalized and one of the women said to her, why? She obviously didn't, didn't fit with everybody else who was there. She said, why are you here? And she said, I couldn't tell her I was a Jew. She had no idea what a Jew was. She said, I'm here because I belong to an ancient tribe that believes every person is an image of God. And that's why I'm here. And I just thought there are, there are non-religious versions of that same sort of sentiment, although obviously I'm, I'm going to promote the religious one. But that notion of the fundamental kinship of human beings from everywhere makes you realize that giving to someone else, however different they may be in orientation or ideas from you, can actually tremendously elevate your spirit. Mm. So. Mm. Indeed. No, that's beautiful. So there you have it. Um, and now, what would you like people to do? Let's have a call to action. Um, as we uh, come close to the close. So everybody who's watching here, all, obviously all in different financial and other circumstances, what can they do? Uh, other than read the back of the book, which tells them what to do. <laughs> um, I do think a lot can start by just um, uh, inviting a group of friends around and have a dinner and just dream, dream together. 
Um, so that, that would be one thing. A second thing would be next time you're online, look for someone who's trying to share something beautiful about the world, <clears throat> uh, whether it's wonder or knowledge or humor or laughter, and just amplify them, give them a little love, you know, re respond to them, repost them, whatever. The, the, the algorithms right now are leaning slightly the wrong way, but they can be pushed and nudged. And the more of us decide to do this, uh, there will be ripple effects from that. Um, the third thing I'd say financially is, I mean, look, I do think that the Jewish tradition of tithing is hugely important. In the book, I may I try and construct an argument that the um, the Islamic tradition of zakat uh, is also yeah. really relevant for the modern era. The, basically, the, the guidance there is to give away a 40th of your wealth annually, not your income, your wealth. So two and a half percent. Right. I... I think there's a case for people who, like, if if a, a, a significant number of people who wanted to be really contribute to the public good pledged to give the higher of those two, 10% of income or 2.5% of net worth annually, I mean, I've done the math on this, and it raises so much money that essentially you could you could address all of the problems that philanthropy could address. You could you could you could build such an exciting future that way. So if anyone wants to go on that journey, and, that's... <laughs> and for people for people who would like some guidance, they want to give money away, but they don't. There are so many charities and so many causes. Can you give them any general guidance? It, it, spend the time to figure out what is effective. There are orders of magnitude difference. It's not just about looking at percentage spent on overhead. That's the worst measure. The, the thing to look at is what is the impact per dollar spent in terms of social change? And what is the method of leverage? How is your money being leveraged? You can, philanthropy is small compared with the other forces in the world, like the markets or like government, but philanthropy can leverage government, can sh show government good policy and unlock huge amounts of extra money, or it can leverage entrepreneurship and help build companies that can get to profitability and solve some social good, uh, companies that the market themselves might not invest in, or it can leverage a piece of technology. Laura mentioned the satellite that uh, we're launching through the Audacious Project that you know, one little thing the size of a washing machine can see in detail where methane leaks are happening across the planet and alert the companies that are doing that to do something about it. And, you know, methane is, is short term is as big a, a cause of global heating as uh, CO2. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, there, there are, and, 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 and ultimately, I think what makes the difference is to join, is when you found the organization where you feel common ground, you're joining a community of supporters there right. who will be great friends and will be great participants in your ongoing generosity journey. And and lastly, I suppose to to uh, to wrap up um, from your years in TED. Uh, I, I mean, I can I can think of I in fact mentioned one to you, the guy who found all these uh, brilliant musicians just um, in the slums, just and just taught them music. Like, can you give us an example of something inspiring that someone did that helped change the world? that was really an act of spontaneous generosity. I remember you, you told me that was in Brazil. I had remembered it as Egypt, but you corrected me. But I, I just thought it was extraordinary that he thought there has to be musical talent. I just have to find it. He found it mm -hmm. and it was everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Um, yeah. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a Ted fellow who, um, Give it. Give a talk about. He just noticed that um, the trash pickers in in Brazil were getting a raw deal. That they were um, doing all this work. Basically, they accounted for a huge amount of the recycling of um, trash, and you know, making a big difference. But but they they were they were invisible essentially, um, and so he. Um, started painting their wagons with these beautifully creative images and slogans, you know, saying things, hey, my car doesn't pollute, or, you know, just uh. talking about some of the numbers and gave this huge sense of pride to them. Um, 
his, this guy's name is Tiago Mondano. Um, and it started um, a movement, like a, a, what became a worldwide movement where, I mean, trash pickers became celebrated in Rio. They, they were, you know, invited to speak at companies and, uh, you know, they're just their whole social status was driven just right. by the fact of creativity. And I think what I found so inspiring about this is like one person's creativity can create these infectious ripple effects. Um, wow. So it's, you know, we talked about courage, David, but creativity is another huge piece of this. If if we if we could just dream a little more about how we do our kindness, make it a little more <laughs> crazy in a way, um, it, it may well have much, 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 much bigger effect. You do, you talk about creativity and humor and all the, all the things that people can bring to kindness, but also it strikes me that that story is also about the fact that he paid attention. Well, we, to sort of circle back to the beginning, he saw them and so he so, wanted sure others would see them too. So thank you so much for inspiring us, for writing this book and for helping to teach us how to be more generous and have a wonderful TED conference and uh, may all of us learn to be more generous. Thank you, David. Sure. <laughs> Thank and thanks, you thanks, if I could just say that, th thanks everyone for spending the time here and for the generous work that you do. It's, it's, um, it's, it's great to get to spend time with you. Thank you. And thank oh, you, Beth. Well Absolutely. Thank you both so much for joining us. This has been uh, an absolute delight to spend an hour uh, eavesdropping on a, a very rich and, and inspiring conversation. Uh, so thank you for, for your generosity and sharing your your time and expertise and, and experience and curiosity with us. Uh, it's been a great gift to, to us all in this hour. Uh, and just just to um, to thank again Laura Lauder for bringing uh, oh. Rabbi Wolpe and, and Chris to us today uh, and for uh, her generosity in offering to share a copy of Infectious Generosity, Chris Anderson's new book with our JFN members. Uh, so if you are here and you are a member, please look out next week for an email coming from JFN as a reminder and then uh, a follow up email from Amazon to enable you to redeem a copy and uh, let us know uh let us know how you take this uh this mission forward chris's call to to action uh we would love to hear how uh how this sparks uh your generosity moving forward i'm planning a dinner party <laughs> uh so thank I you did. again Bye. everyone take care <laughs>